Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. Don't be anxious. Learn to cruise. I have three, three speeds in my life. Slow, slower, and stop. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hello friend, it is almost Christmas. In today's message, we're actually going to be looking at the Christmas story through a particular hero's eyes. We're going to look at the Christmas story through the eyes of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And oh my, how things must have appeared to Joseph. You're not going to want to miss a single moment of this, so get ready. Won't you please find Matthew chapter 1 with me, if you would. Matthew's Gospel, the first chapter. And I would like to talk to you for a little while about the Christmas story, but as it would have unfold, unfolded through the eyes of Joseph. You know, we talk about, you know, the shepherds. We, we talk a lot about Mary. Uh, we, we talk about all these different elements, but really one of the unsung heroes in the whole story was Joseph. Just like Mary was chosen to bring the Son of God, the Savior, into the world, Joseph was chosen as well. Now, from Matthew chapter 1, we understand that he was chosen because he was in the direct lineage of uh, King David, and it was a fulfillment of prophecy, but there was more than that. There were more factors involved. There's some qualities in Joseph's life that made him a candidate for God's choosing, just like there were qualities in the life of young Mary that made her the candidate for God's choosing. And we're going to talk about probably four, at least four of those qualities in Joseph's life as we, again, look at the Christmas story through his eyes. And the first thing that stood out to me is this, that he was just. Joseph was a just man. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. Matthew 1 and verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away or divorce her secretly. He was a just man, the scripture says. In other words, upright. He did what was right in God's sight. You could look at it this way. He was just. He acted just like God. He was just. Specifically, we see that as the things unfolded, he thought about Mary when he found out she was pregnant and not about himself. He wasn't motivated to get revenge or he wasn't filled with self-pity thinking, I'm going to drag your name through the mud and everybody's going to know what you've done. Or he didn't take it a step further, which he could have, and had her stone, had the community stone her according to the law of Moses. I mean, think about it. Mary has her encounter with the angel. The spirit overshadows her. She becomes pregnant. Then according to Luke's account, she goes to her cousin Elizabeth's house. Elizabeth is married to a priest named Zacharias, and she stays there three months. And then she comes back to Joseph pregnant. He doesn't know anything about the angel and the announcement and the Holy Spirit. I just imagine when he comes back and she comes back, he goes, hey, Mary, man, Elizabeth must be a good cook. You're, you're, you're putting on a, a little bit of weight there, girl. She goes, Joseph, I, I have something to tell you. And he said, look, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said anything about that. I love you. I love every pound of you, Mary. Don't, 
Don't worry about it. No, no, Joseph, I've got something to tell you. Please listen. Okay, what is it, babe? I'm pregnant. What? I'm going to have a baby. Mary, how could you? Who, what, what, what was it? Your cousin's husband? What, what's his name? Zacharias? You're some priest he is. No, Joseph, it wasn't Zacharias. What, what, do you even know the father's name? What, some stranger? Joseph, it's all right. What do you mean it's all right? Mary, you've ruined both of our lives. No, Joseph, it's all right. It's God. Mary, you're telling me God led you to have sex with somebody? Is that what you're saying? No, no, it's not what I'm saying, Joseph. God is the Father. What? <laughs> Mary, come on. I was born at night, but not last night. Give me a break. No, no, Joseph, it's true. This angel appeared. Oh, first it's God. Now it's an angel. Next you're going to say that Moses and Elijah were there cheering you on. No, oh, Joseph, please, please listen to me. It's all right. Well, well, an angel appeared and announced what God wanted to do, and then the Holy Spirit overshadowed me, and suddenly I was pregnant. Mary, please. It's bad enough that you committed adultery and ruined our lives and now to cover it up with a stupid story like this. Just get away from me. I have to think. And that's just what it says. Joseph went and he thought about these things. And it's interesting. If you look at it through his eyes, his whole world had to be falling apart. The girl he loves and is about to marry is pregnant with somebody else's baby. He's going to become the laughing stock of Nazareth. All of his plans, all of his dreams have come crashing down around him. But in the midst of it all, he's thinking about Mary, not wanting her to become a public spectacle. And you know what? Many a man fueled by feelings of betrayal and hurt, would have said, look, let the whole world know what she'd done. I deserve better than this. But Joseph was a just man. He was a man of mercy. He acted just like God, who even though we've been unfaithful, God remains faithful to us and merciful to us. And Joseph was a just man. Man, and I think if we're going to emulate that, we obviously need to think about others, including those that have trespassed against us, and think about extending them mercy in the same way that God has extended us mercy, rather than be eaten up with thoughts of revenge or wallowing in a sea of self-pity. Now, the second thing that stands out to me in the story about Joseph is this. He was not rash. Joseph was not rash. Verse 20, same chapter, Matthew 1. It says, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, he shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, Joseph wasn't rash. He didn't make an angry decision. The scripture says he thought about these things. We need to think twice before we speak once, and we need to think even more before we act. Ecclesiastes 7 and 9 says, Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Ecclesiastes 5 and 2, do not be rash with your mouth. Proverbs 19 and 2, a man in a hurry makes mistakes. James 1 and 19, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, or slow to get angry. If you are given 
to making rash decisions, especially when you're angry or hurt, most of the time you will just compound your problems. The book of James says, the wrath of man, the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Don't be anxious. Learn to cruise. I have three, three speeds in my life. Slow, slower, and stop. <laughs> Joseph was not rash. It's a beautiful thing that we read about him. And then there's just something else I think we, we should consider here that while Joseph pondered these unfolding events, God communicated with him. When he took time to think about it, God spoke. And I believe as we get quiet and take time to ponder and think about things, rather than flying off the handle and making a rash decision, that we give God the opportunity to reveal his mind in that particular matter. While Joseph thought about these things, while he pondered them, while he waited and mulled it over and probably prayed, what do I do? God spoke. But if we're given to flying off the handle and just making a, a rash decision, I, I think we don't even give time for God to speak into this situation. And it brings me to the third thing that stood out to me about Joseph, and it's this. Though, though he was not rash, once he understood God's will, he was obedient. Joseph was obedient. Look with me, this same chapter, next verse, verse 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. I want you to notice, as soon as he woke up, and understood God's will, he acted upon it immediately. When he awoke, he did what God had said to him in the dream through the angel. He didn't hedge or vacillate, even though there was probably going to be some uncomfortable consequences for him. He's going to have to face family members and friends that think he's a fool for going ahead and marrying this girl that's already pregnant. Anybody would have been able to do the math and say, okay, you know, she got pregnant before you guys got married and you stuck with her anyway. He, he's going to have to deal with that. And even in the Gospels, there's at least some hints that there were these, these lingering rumors about the legitimacy of Jesus' birth among the people. In John 8 and 41, some of the religious leaders, Jesus is confronting them and they say, hey, we're not illegitimate. God is our father. And some commentators say that it was sort of a backhanded statement. We're not illegitimate like some of the people standing around here. Yeah, we know the rumors. Joseph's not your daddy. Joseph would have had to deal with all of those things. And yet he still promptly obeyed. And I believe that timely obedience reaps timely blessings. I think perhaps the delays we experience in receiving answers from God may be directly tied to our delayed obedience to bless others. Here's an unalterable law in Scripture, Galatians 6, 7. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If my obedience is, is always delayed in, in blessing others and, and giving of my time, my treasure, my talent, whatever it is, and then when I'm in need, I'm going to reap the same way that I've sown. Now, now, don't get me wrong. God's mercy overrides a lot of stuff. You know, and God, repentance is a big deal with God. And if we mean it, you know, God will work on credit. God, I promise, you know, the next time you talk to me, you know, I'm, I'm going to act 
immediately. God says, okay, I'll take you at your word. But that there is a law we throw into motion, even when it comes to obedience. If we're delayed, it comes back to us the same way. Joseph was obedient. In fact, look in chapter 2 with me, if you would. Verses 13 and verse 14. Now when they had departed, that's talking about the wise man, departed for home. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt. Stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. In obedience, he uprooted his entire family and moved to a foreign land. Joseph left family, friends, community, everything that was familiar, and he went into the unfamiliar because God directed him there. I think many times as we walk the pathway of obedience with God, that pathway will take us straight out of our comfort zone and into the unfamiliar. You know, my little Midwestern wife, Janet's from a a little rural area in central Wisconsin, And she moved herself here to the big city in Southern California, way out of her comfort zone, way out of what she was familiar with, left family, left friends, left everything she'd known, and came here because she realized, like all of us should, that we're just pilgrims in this life. We're sojourners just passing through. And eternity, you know, will open up before us. I think every one of us as Christ followers should be prompt and and willing to go where God says to go and to do whatever he asks us to do. Friend, God can make the worst places serve his best purposes. And the safest place to be is in the middle of God's will. Not only did did Joseph not question God's choice of location, He didn't question God's method of protecting the child and the family. He could have said, well, look, isn't this God's son? Can't he just call a a legion of, of, you know, archangels to protect us? Can't he just strike Herod dead? Can't he wither the hand that's stretched out against him? Yes, to all of those things. But many times God chooses a way that we would not choose to fulfill his purposes. He accomplishes things how he wants to accomplish them. He works all things according to the counsel of his own will. It says in Ephesians, not our will, but according to the counsel of his will. He doesn't choose methods and means that we would normally choose, but we need to continue trusting him, which is what Joseph did. And that's the fourth thing I want to talk to you about. He trusted. Joseph lived in dependence upon God. I don't know if you noticed, but when God through the angel said to Joseph, go into Egypt, got his family together and he left, God didn't say where in Egypt. Egypt is a big place. But Joseph packed up his family, what little belongings he had, and they headed to Egypt. He was trusting that once he got there, God would give him the next step in the journey. Now, many commentators feel that Joseph, Mary, and Jesus were actually in Egypt for more than a year, even multiple years. And some of them go as far as to say they estimate he was there for seven years. But the thing is, until Herod died, there was silence. There's no record of God speaking to him through a dream given him any further direction whatsoever. Perhaps years of silence, but Joseph stayed and he trusted. And then the word of the Lord came to him that Herod had died. And he came back to Israel as we're gonna read in a moment. I think we should all be faithful to continue doing the last thing God told us to do until we receive fresh direction. 
to just stay at it. Verse 19 of chapter 2. It says, Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life were dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. Now, again, notice it doesn't say where in Israel. Israel's a big place, especially to a carpenter from a small village. But he immediately gathered up his family and obeyed God, trusting God to direct him once he got moving. You know, when Jeremiah was talking to the Lord, the Lord said, Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the potter's house, and there I'll cause you to hear my words. Now, Jeremiah could have said, well, Lord, I'm actually hearing your words right now. I mean, didn't you just tell me to go to the potter's house? Well, just lay it on me. Just tell me what you want me to know. But God said, now you go there and I'll talk more to you. There was a lesson that he needed to learn from the potter making that clay pot on the wheel that Jeremiah never would have gotten had he not gone there. Philip, there's a raging revival going on in the city of Samaria. He's leading the revival. The Holy Spirit said, go out to the desert. That's it. No more direction. He goes out to the desert and then the Holy Spirit speaks again. said, look, there's an Ethiopian eunuch this guy's powerful in, in Ethiopia. He's right under the queen. Go talk to him. Shares with him, gets him saved, baptizes him in water, and the door to an entire nation is now open. But he didn't know that. The only direction he had was go out to the desert. Saul of Tarsus, going to Damascus to persecute Christians, meets Jesus on the road, gets saved. The Lord says, go into the city, and it'll be told you what you must do. Yeah. Oh, okay, Lord, we're having a conversation now. Just, just tell me what to do now. Now the Lord said, you go and you wait. Three days fasting, waiting, praying. Then Ananias comes in and gives him the next steps that he needs to take. God generally just gives us a little bit of light and we need to walk in that light before he gives us more. Good. Now, tonight, you get in your car. If you've got a car here, you turn it on. The headlights will come on. They'll shine 50 feet in front of you. You can sit in the car from now till you die if you're thinking, I'm not going home until my headlights shine all the way home. No, they're going to give you 50 feet of light. You drive that 50 feet, they'll give you 50 more feet of light. God will do you the same way. Yeah. Walk in the light that he gives you, and God will give you more <laughs> light. Now, as we, we've seen, Joseph had a significant role to play in the birth and in the preservation of God's son throughout his early years. The son that he named Jesus, who came to save us from our sins. And Jesus did just that. He died on the cross as a sin sacrifice. As my representative and as your representative, and all of the justified punishment of God against my sin, he laid it on Jesus and Jesus died under the weight of my sins and your sins. The claims of God's eternal justice were satisfied. And on the third day, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And the Bible says this, if you'll believe that, put your trust in him. God brings you into a relationship with himself that the Bible calls salvation. It's about walking and talking with a God who made you. Just for a moment, bow your heads, close your eyes if you don't mind. Of course, you don't have to, but I think sometimes it helps us to just block out distractions. And I just want to encourage you to just have a moment of prayer with me if you would. Maybe a friend brought you here tonight. Maybe you've been coming for a while to check things out. Who knows? Maybe you came to one of the evenings of the production this last week and thought, well, I'm, I'm going to check out their regular church, or church services. And here you are. I do not believe that is a coincidence. 
My friend, God wants to have a relationship with you. And I, I will tell you from the outset, it is going to shake things up in your world. God does not step into a person's life and leave them the same. He takes us just as we are. But the moment we come to him, he begins to work a, a marvelous change inside of us. You are loved by God, my friend. He sent his son to die on the cross to take away your sin so that you can come into a relationship with the God who created you. Will you pray with me? Maybe you've never prayed a prayer like this. Maybe you're a backslider that's away from God. Good news is God's not mad at you, friend, but it's time to come home. Maybe just everyone in the house for a moment, put a hand on your heart. I'm gonna give you some words to pray but they mean nothing unless you put a sincere heart behind them. But if you mean business, as we speak these words to God, he'll hear you and he will come to your life. The love of God is packaged in his son, Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me, friends? Say, oh God, I come to you tonight. I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that he did die on the cross as my substitute. That he bore the penalty for all of my sins. I ask you to wash me clean. Do what I cannot do. Rescue me, O oh God. Help me by your mighty power. I confess your son Jesus as the Lord of my life. Jesus, I yield my life to you. I give you everything. And I choose to follow you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Awesome. Well, I hope that you were blessed by that. And I hope that you prayed as we prayed that prayer at the end of the service. There's nothing like having a Christmas with Christ in it. It is all about Jesus. My friend, he is real. He loves you. He knows you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You know what? If you get a chance, drop us a note, send us an email. We would love to hear from you. Until next time, God bless you. Hi there. We have a daily email devotional that I believe can be of great benefit to you. You know, when we take God's Word in every day, it helps us become established in the Lord. Make room in your daily schedule for God's Word by signing up for Bayless's devotionals, available on your phone, tablet, or PC. Take time to sow the seeds of God's Word in your life every day with this free email devotional. We're grateful for the friends and partners of Answers with Bayless Conley who help make this program possible. For more information and inspiration, visit BaylessConley.tv.